Mina, konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. I'm at camp, and here is my first long Sunday video. Ooh, it's, the room itself is really incredibly small, and there's no padding of any kind. Kind of like my room. So the video quality is going to be bad because it's on my phone. The sound quality is going to be bad because it's a very echoey, not filled room. Plus, it's on my phone. So you've got some really bad quality coming your way. If you're watching, thank you so much. It is greatly appreciated. But I do feel, despite the crappy quality, that I do have a message from the Lord for you guys tonight. Um, as I was praying and first day at camp, like I said, the first video, uh, expectations, you know, kind of not huge or excited about camp. First day, went about as expected, so nothing amazing happened, no miracles that I know so far, although I had some kind of bumper bruise on my leg and I prayed for it. Went away and it's like, there's like not even, it's not even visible anymore, not that you can see it, not that you really wanted to see any of this, but yeah, there was like a big old red bump there and like two lines, probably just some kind of weird thing I was leaning against or something that hit me. So doubt that was a miracle, but I won't deny it was nice that, uh, I said it disappeared after I prayed for it. So all you skeptics, just you, you keep on doubting, even though you should. And this message is really directed more at the Christians than the non-Christians. It's much more directed at them. So, fellow believers, brothers and sisters, heirs of the kingdom to come, take heed and give me a little bit of your time, if you would, please. I'm going to come at you with some very popular verses out of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Sound familiar yet? It should. And just as an aside, when I keep saying that we as Christians, we don't fight physical wars anymore like the nation of Israel. Our wars are much more in the realm of the spirit, in the realm of ideas, and the mind. This is like the go-to verse for that. We don't war according to the flesh. We walk in it but we don't war according to the flesh. So we're not out here to kill people or bomb abortion clinics or, you know, or kill homosexuals or anything stupid like that. That's not what we're called to do. We want those people to be saved. We want those people to come to know Jesus Christ. We want to show them his love. Yes, judgment on sin where things are wrong. We don't want to approve that which is wrong, but we want to love these people. God loves them. We need to love them as well. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds. Tonight I want to focus on that word weapons. What I really feel the Lord is calling for specifically America right now to do is we need to be filled with the Spirit and then be equipped with His weapons and then wage warfare with the weapons that He gives us. There is a battle going on for the heart and soul of America, for the heart and soul of all the people you see around you every single day. And the battle is not just for you. I mean, you're definitely a part of it. And you, need, you do need to fight for yourself and you need to win your battles. There's also a fight outside of you that's bigger than you. And it's a fight that we need to fight for our loved ones, for our friends, for our neighbors, for our enemies, for our counties and towns and cities and states and the entire country as well. And if you're watching outside of the United States, if this happens to reach you, there's a battle for your country too. This is not just a United States thing. We're America, so we're going to fight. Yeah, no, no. This is a fight for every single believer. Weapons of our warfare. God wants us equipped with weapons. Weapons that can, verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the primary battlefield for ourselves and for others, it's, it's, a, it's an attack of the mind. And I'm going to reference a vid the, vid the Dark Souls video I did with Robbie a few days ago, um, which I actually, no, I haven't put that out yet. It's coming out, where me and him have this really super serious talk about some of the things in the Bible that are, it's not only hard for non-Christians to understand, um, sometimes it's hard for Christians to understand and accept. And my view I'm definitely sure it's not the most positive or popular view out there, but I do believe it is biblically consistent and logically consistent as well. So when those videos come out, look forward to it. Um, we cover lots of fun stuff in those videos, like the genocide that the Israelites committed in the land of Canaan. That topic comes up 
and I covered it. It wasn't a sermon video, of all things, it was a preaching video, full of my normal cussing that I do in my video game videos. So it's an interesting blend of preaching slash video gaming slash me being a person that not a lot of Christians would want to listen to, <laughs> apparently. And some very hypocritically, I will add. The weapons that God gives us, they are there to fight against bad ideologies, bad arguments, things that exalt themselves, raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. And God has given us weapons to fight. And those weapons are spiritual, not carnal. Now, there's nothing wrong with having like mental like arguments. There's nothing wrong with, I want to be logically consistent. I want to understand the word of God. But that's not the full crux here. The main oomph of the battle is spiritual. The main oomph of the battle is not going to be just my words and my logical arguments clashing with a non-Christian's logical arguments. Even though I believe mine stand up reasonably, not just reasonably well, very well. I think they're solid. I think they're right there. That's not where the battleground is. People are saved when they accept Jesus into their heart, not their mind. Christians a lot of the times make the mistake of living for God and having a knowledge of Him here and living for Him here, but it doesn't quite get down to here. It doesn't quite get to the heart. And so they mentally recognize it, but they don't quite live it out. And they don't live in victory. They don't live in the power that God promises to give. And just for more of a spiritual oomph and to get into the weapons a little bit, I want to go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Yep, more popular stuff tonight. More stuff you've heard from the preacher a hundred times. I love the way my channel usually covers stuff that isn't covered mainstream. Like, I'm reading stuff out of Judges and um, Joshua and a little bit of Deuteronomy that, like, you will never hear in a church, which is a crying shame. Pastors should be able to say, yeah, I believe God commanded genocide, and I believe he was just in doing so, and here's why. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If any um, skeptic is still watching, if so, thank you so much for that. You don't have to agree with, with us. Fellow Christians, you don't have to agree with us, honestly. But you say you believe in this book, so I hope you have some kind of an answer that makes sense when you're presented with these things. Um, I heard, I won't list this source at the moment, but I remember hearing um, an atheist debate a Christian. He was like, yeah, did you know your Bible actually talks about how to treat slaves and how God ordered the genocide of men and women? And the Christian was like, the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't happen. And the atheist was like, yeah, yeah, it does. And he's like, no, no, you're making that up. It's not in there. It's not in there at all. And the atheist didn't like pull out a Bible and present the verses. I wish he had. I wish that Christian had been wrecked because he wasn't ready to fight. He wasn't ready to fight. And it's not, again, it's not all about ideas. That's not even the main point of the battle. But it's certainly, if we're going to fight in the realm of ideas, even though we're fighting spiritually, it doesn't hurt to have a few of your own ideas to bring to the battle. That's not a bad thing, like a godly way of thinking, a godly way of living and believing. Those are very, very helpful and very important to this battle. But it's just, it's not a battle just of the mind and just of the heart. It extends into the spirit as well. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Again, if you've been in church for any time, you've heard this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and put on the armor. And it, it goes on to list the armor, um, but I want to focus on this for just a minute. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Guys, if you're with the Lord, you're on the winning side. Like, we, I don't need to cover the omnis, right? Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, and he's everywhere at once. He, he, Pretty much every Christian knows that. So that, that's not news to you guys, and I'm not going to go into the verses to prove those things. Maybe at some other point I'll go into like the fundamentals and why, you know, what Christians believe and where they are in the Bible. Not here. Um, I'm going to go ahead with the assumption that you've heard this, you're familiar with this, and you've probably even heard this passage preached from the pulpit before. 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. There's no limit to His power. If He gives us armor, we're good. If He gives us weapons, like I read back in 2 Corinthians, we're good. We can attack and we can defend with the all-powerful Lord backing us up. We can do this, guys and girls. We can win this fight. And we can stand against the wiles of the devil. He doesn't have to win. He doesn't get to win unless we let him. Now, that, please think on that for just a second. He does not win unless, he let him, unless we let him. How can a, a petty little fallen angel stand against the all-powerful God that created him? He can't. If he's winning, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve when they both ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil didn't make them do it. He persuaded them to do it, and they foolishly listened to his lies. That hasn't changed. The tactic hasn't changed. The devil can't create. He can't force you to do. He can only lie to you, deceive you, and persuade you to do things that go against God. So be equipped with the things of God, with the knowledge of God, with arguments on the side of God, things that exalt the knowledge of God, not exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Don't be strong just in video games or just in your job or just in your marriage or just in your willpower, your self-sustenance, because dude, do that, you're going to fail. You're going to fall. You need the Lord's strength. You need the Lord's weapons. You need the Lord's power. You need the Lord's armor. It's not enough for you to just one man or one girl it. Or even get a whole team of y'all together and say, we're going to do this thing. We're going to power through it. If you're doing it in and of yourself, without the Lord's power, you're doing it in the flesh. And even though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. Because flesh can't beat flesh. Flesh can't stand up against the devil. It will lose every single time. If you're living in defeat, if you keep giving into that temptation, the fault lies squarely on you. The devil isn't making you do it. You're saying yes to his lie each and every time. And if you are demonically possessed, that is another story altogether. That's another sermon for another time. Um... Don't wait for me to preach on it. I'm sure I will one day, but don't wait on me to preach on it. If you feel like you have a serious demonic problem, and to the skeptics who are wanting to t tune out right now, I've told you before and I'll say it again. I'm one of those charismatic Christians. I believe that the spirit world's real. Angels and demons are real as well as God. Um, I believe in the whole gambit, the whole nine yards. It's all real. If you are demonically possessed, seek help. Now go to someone now, not just on YouTube. YouTube's fine and the internet's fine, but you need to find a person who can back you up in this battle. That's a fight of your life. Don't go in that alone. Let me strongly encourage you while I'm on that point. So while I'm here, I'm going to read down the armor. And for the most part, it's self-explanatory. Um, going into verse 12, for, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, our fellow humans, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Again, our battle is not just arguments. It's not just talking. And it's not with other people. Homosexuality is a sin. Abortion is a sin. Fornication, sex outside of marriage is a sin. Lying is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Things of the heart like lust and envy and greed, they're all sins. But our primary battle isn't one of the flesh. Our primary battle is against the rulers of the darkness of this age. That's where the primary battle lies. Yes, we do have to fight against our own sin nature. That is indeed a battle. And I believe these weapons can definitely apply to that as well. But just recognize that you're not just fighting against like some inner mental you know handicap or something you were born with or some environment you were born in that's holding you back no there are demons that want to destroy you that try to that throw lies at you all day long they mentally attack you they emotionally attack you and they're trying to pull you down they hate your guts they want to destroy you take you away from jesus and they want you to burn in hell and the fight is against them 
Therefore, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, that day when you're tempted, that day when things are falling apart, and having done all, done all of what? Done all that you can in the power of God and in the strength that he provides you. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So having done all, all that you can do with the Lord's help, which is anything you need to do, and in the end of the verse, to stand. Kind of goes back to what I've said a few times. Those who endure to the end will be saved. If you have the armor of God on and you're withstanding in the evil day, after you've done all, you will be able to stand. And if you hear something else that you can't win, there's no way you can overcome whatever it is you're going through. There's no way you can live for God. There's no way you can love God. There's no way you can set aside this sin that set you back for years. That's a lie. Yes, you can. You really can. It's right here in God's word. You can. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and here, so there's your armor, and you've got one weapon. The sword, a sword is a weapon. And it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You want to be able to fight. You want to know what's sin. You want strength to attack with and not just defend with. Read His Word. Study His Word. Memorize. Memorize. His word. Get into it. You want to be able to attack, memorize his word. And then continuing in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer is another mm, weapon. It's another powerful attack against the enemy that can change your life and change the lives of those around you. You're allowed to pray for other people, and you're also allowed to pray for yourself. It's not one or the other, it's both, in case there was a misconception there. You pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and supplication for all the saints. If you're praying in, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and supplication for all the saints, that tells me you're praying for yourself, and you're praying for all the saints. And even though it doesn't mention in this verse, let me just throw this out there. Pray for those who don't know Jesus, okay? Pray for them as well. Your prayers aren't just limited to the church, you and your brothers and sisters in Christ. Prayer changes the world around you. Try it. You might be very pleasantly surprised. And going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, you may not hear about th these verses so much in the non-charismatic churches, but I'm a charismatic dude, so I'm going to read them to you. These are more weapons. These are more spiritually powerful weapons that God equips us with and strengthens us with so that we are able to do His work in this world and so that we are able to stand against the evil one and attack him and win. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There are diversities of gifts with the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, to each one, to each one. If you believe in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, a manifestation is given to each one for the profit of all, the entire church. If you're a believer, you have something. You have one of these gifts I'm about to read off. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles. Yeah, that stuff still exists today. It's still around. To another prophecy. That still exists today. That's still around. To another discerning of spirits to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So all and the healings and the tongues and the interpretation, discerning of spirits, all of this weird stuff that you see in the Bible, 
it still happens today. Now there's a whole argument against that, and I'm not going to cover that in this video as well, but that stuff ex exists today. Those gifts have not disappeared, and we all have one. And then to conclude in verse 11, but one of the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So not everyone speaks in tongues, not everyone prophesies. Um, that's not the case. Actually, let me just go down and read some more stuff. Hop down to verse 27. Same chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teacher. Chers. Sorry, plural. Third teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. A few more gifts there. A few more things mentioned there that are giftings from God. And without going into like a description of each of these gifts, that would be several messages. Just know that these are things that the Lord has given us to win. To win for His kingdom, to win for our lives, to win for our loved ones and friends and families, to win for our households, for our neighborhoods, for our counties, for our cities, for our states, for our countries even. We are given divinely powerful weapons to win. Now, on to the next part are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. And the answer, by the way, is no. There's not someone who has all the gifts and just does everything. Jesus alone did that. And some people have more gifts than others. Some people may only have one or two. But you have your part to play. You have your role. And God's given what you, what you need to succeed in your life, to put away sin in your life, to live for Him, to love Him. He's given you weapons. He's given you power. And all of this comes about by the Spirit of God. You want, the Lord, you want to walk in the power of the Lord and the strength of His might? You need His Spirit to do that. You need the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is like a good starting ground for all of this stuff. And I disagree with old-timey Pentecostals who are like, it has to be tongues. Um, that's definitely what it is. I personally do not agree with that. And I'm going to find you a verse here in Ephesians chapter 5, and that's verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Um, you go into the book of Acts, where it talks about, um, where like the traditional Pentecostals talk about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let's just, let's turn there real quick. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, where all the apostles started speaking in tongues, which was an amazing thing and an amazing moment. Let's go to verse 4. What does it say? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We are all commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Now that isn't, if you read in the book of Acts, it doesn't, it's not always accompanied by tongues. Again, that's another sermon for another time. I hinted so many things and I don't talk about them. <laughs> but ask God. Do you want to be filled with the Spirit? It's this simple. Let me do the, give you the easy way. It's not necessarily Pentecostal. It may not necessarily involve tongues. Some will disagree with me on that. By all means, leave comments um, in the description. Uh, not in the description below. Only I can do that. But leave comments in the comment section below. I'd love to talk about that. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, ask. Ask. And that goes back. I believe it's in John chapter 7. Let me see if I can find it for you guys. Um, time is running a little bit on the low side here. But let me see if I can't find that verse. I think I might have just found it. John 7, verse 37, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. <laughs> but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. If you're a Christian... You have the Holy Spirit in you. You want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? The best model I can give you, I told you a minute ago just to ask. Let me, get, let me go back to Acts chapter... Uh, two. I read you the beginning of Acts chapter 2 a minute ago. 
Let me back it up a little bit here. Let me. I want to say it's in Acts chapter 1 because this didn't happen immediately after Jesus left. It didn't happen like just the instant he ascended into heaven. It happened over a period of time. And it, well, I want to find the verse where it says there were a hundred, it was 120 days that they were in, the, in an upper room and they were, pl- and they were praying. Sorry, I didn't prepare this in advance like a ton, guys. I do apologize for that. Because once some Jesus ascended into heaven, they returned to Jerusalem, and when they entered, they were in the upper room where they were staying, lists all the disciples, some of the women. And in those days, uh, Peter stood up. Oh, okay, the number of... I'm sorry, I actually misquoted that. My mistake altogether, the number of names was about 120. That was not the number of days, that was the number of people. So, from when Jesus rose again up to the day of Pentecost, we going into chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Then the Holy Spirit came. That didn't just happen immediately as soon as Jesus ascended. They had to seek for it, they had to pray for it. They all gathered in that room. Peter cast lots to fill Judas's place, and they stayed there and they prayed and they sought the Lord until the Holy Spirit would come. And that goes on. Actually, that'll be a good place to end this particular sermon. Going back to Acts chapter 2 one more time. Believe it or not, I actually did read up on these things to prepare for it for the most part. Just things are coming to mind. I want to include them as well. So at this time, I'm glad I've studied the Bible and I can point to some things around. I have, I've tried to work with my sword, so I'll know how to wield it at least somewhat properly. Here we are. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. If you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, if you want his gifts, if you want his power, if you want to win, you're going to have to seek him. You're going to have to want him like, uh, like you want oxygen to breathe, like you want food to eat. You're going to want him that bad. When you want him more than the breath you breathe and more than the next heartbeat, you'll find him. He's there, I promise you. He's just waiting. For those of you who have listened to this, and there's a burning in your heart right now, and you're like, I don't know Jesus, but just... Even though some of this stuff sounded weird, I've stuck with you through the whole way because there is something in my heart like, I want this. I want this Jesus you're talking about. Here's the gospel message. Here's the good news. Jesus is God in the, in the flesh. He came in the flesh around about 2,000 years ago. He died on a cross, shedding his blood so your sins can be forgiven. Just like, let's face it, we've all done things that are wrong. We've all done things that are bad. And he died on the cross so those things could be forgiven. And he also rose again three days later because death ain't got nothing on God. So if you will believe that Jesus died for you and that he rose again, you can be saved. You can get the Holy Spirit. You can start seeking the filling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, and the gifts that God wants to put in your life. As soon as you believe in him, you can start seeking these things. And if you want a prayer model to follow... Like you want something just to say, like, yeah, I, I do believe that. How do I say it? If you don't, if you have, you by all means put in your own words, but if you want just a model to pray, pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner and I admit I need your help. I believe that you died on the cross 2,000 years ago, shedding your blood so that I could be forgiven for my sin. And I believe you rose three days later, that you're alive and well and that you're hearing this prayer. Please forgive me. Please come into my heart. Please be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And that's it. That's all it took. And if you meant that prayer, your life is completely changed now and forever. You're one of the family. You're part of the family of God. Congratulations. We welcome you with open arms. Not that you're perfect. Not that you're going to get the Holy Spirit you know, tomorrow. And miracles are just going to start flowing from your fingertips. But you've started a journey. A wonderful, precious journey that will change your life if you stick with it. 
and you continue in faith. Find a bunch of people that believe the same thing as you. Find a church that believes the, that the Bible is the Word of God, that Jesus Christ is God and Lord and Savior. Find people who are like-minded, who, who can encourage you and strengthen you in your, pray, in your faith, pray for you. Make sure you pray for yourself. It's as someone saying, God, I'm, I'm struggling. I need some help. Here's the problem. That's a prayer. I'm just saying, Lord God, thank you for another day. That's a prayer. That totally counts. Go for it. Do that. That is important. And like I said earlier, if I didn't stress it enough, read your Bible. Thank you guys very much for watching this video. I love you and God bless.